We've talked a lot about monarchs this season, and now as we enter into fall, we want to focus on monarch migration. And joining us today is once again Dr. Kristen Baum with Integrative Biology. She's an associate professor with that department. And Dr. Baum, what can you tell us about the monarch migration? Well, we're starting to see monarchs moving through Oklahoma, and we usually think of peak migration being at the very end of September, so usually around the 29th or 30th, but there's usually a 10-day window on either side, so it can be early or late depending on the conditions throughout the, the monarch's range each year. Um, and then, of course, you'll have some stragglers coming through as well, so it's really a, a much wider time period, but we're starting to see some activity um, this year. And the temperature and the wind, everything goes into that, right? It influences the timing. It does, and so in terms of the cues for the monarchs, uh, you know, the temperature and the day length and, um, and factors like that are what, what trigger them to start, start that migratory process. And why is this an important time for you in your research? Well, we do a lot of tagging, so it's really important to know uh, kind of the movement of the monarchs and then, of course, how many are making it to the overwintering grounds and where they're coming from. So tagging monarchs throughout their, their range is, is really important. Um, and so we're out in force trying to, to catch as many monarchs as we can and, and tag them as well to see what Oklahoma is contributing uh, to monarchs. And so what is involved in this process of tagging monarchs? Well, I caught a few monarchs here okay. at the um, OSU Botanic Garden a little bit earlier today. Um, and so uh, I have a glassing envelope, which is just kind of a wax paper envelope mm -hmm. that we keep them in sometimes if we're gonna collect a few to process. And that doesn't harm them, it just keeps it, them so their wings don't get beat up. It right? does, and then the, the kind of waxiness of the paper helps with that as well. So we've got a, a male monarch here. And, if you, and how do you know he's a male? Um, if you look um, at the hind wings, they've got this uh, spot on the hind wing that indicates that, that it's a male. Mm -hmm. There, that little right there, and you mm -hmm. can see it on this side, but it's it's not as obvious. And so, until you're kind of used to, to working with them, it, it, it kind of helps to, to look at both sides. Um, but this is a male monarch, and so for for our research, we'll collect some data in addition to what we need to collect for for Monarch Watch. So, Monarch Watch is the organization that provides the tags, um, and um, anybody can order them. Um, uh, and we have ordered quite a few this year, so I hope, hope you are able to, to tag um, all of the, use all of the tags. Um, and so for, for our research, we measure the, the size of the wings. Okay. Um, and you use this tool? What is this uh, tool? So these are digital calipers, okay. and so they, they just measure, measure length for us in millimeters. And so we'll measure the uh, width of the wing. And so wing and size could factor into to, you know, how well they do on migration. And so knowing of the ones we tag, you know, kind of additional information about them um, can be very helpful as well. Does that play into their age also? If they're a younger butterfly or do they come out of the chrysalis being the size that they're going to be? They're the size they're going to okay. be. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, and then we uh, provide an estimate of, of kind of the condition of the butterfly. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really give you an idea of age, but it could certainly give you an idea of how much they've been through in, in their life. And then we record the activity. So in this case, these were nectaring on some nice nectar plants at the Botanic Gardens. Um, and then we collect a tape count, count sample uh, to test for OE. So OE um, is the abbreviation for Ophryocystes electroscura, which okay. is a <laughs> spore-forming protist, which sounds really complicated, but essentially if the butterflies are infected, um, it means they don't live as long and they can't fly as well, and so they're likely not going to make that migration to Mexico. Okay, so um, it's a spore that actually does harm to the living butterflies. It does. So it, it most of the time doesn't outright kill them. If they're really heavily infected, it could, mm -hmm. but it, it, you know, by decreasing their lifespan and their flight ability, um, it can have a, a negative effect on the, the overall population. Um, and then when the females oviposit, um, they'll leave behind spores, which is how the infection continues. And so, um, and so there's lots of interest in knowing um, how those levels vary mm -hmm. um, among years and then with different regions and different, my interest is land use and, um, and management and, and things like that. Um, and there's a really simple way um, to test for OE um, and uh, citizens can contribute as well. There's a project called um, Project Monarch Health uh, where if you um, contact them, they'll send you um, fancier tape than this. <laughs> this is just, uh, just scotch tape and if you just gently press it against the abdomen, 
um, it'll pull off a few scales um, okay. and then if there's uh, spores it'll pull those off as well and the butterflies you lose their scales over their lifetime anyway so it doesn't harm them and lets us release them so it's a really easy way to, to be able to collect data um, and then also uh, let the monarchs go so we can so, tag them at the same time and so we'll go back and look at this under the microscope okay um, so it's and like be a little slide tell. that you can put under the microscope it is it is them. it works well um, and then the last thing we're going to do to this guy is we're going to put a tag on him and so the, the tags have a three letter and three number code um, and so I'm just going to write that down here um, and then uh, you have to kind of carefully remove the tag and manage not to get it stuck to you um, <laughs> at the same time. Um, and where do you put it on the wing of the butterfly? Um, it's this big cell in the center here, which is called the discal cell. So mm -hmm. it's the one right there. Get it on there and then you hold it for a few seconds just to make sure that the, the, the glue has adhered to the wing well. And our little guy's cooperating there for you. <laughs> he is. Um, and then there's been research to, to document that it doesn't harm the butterflies mm -hmm. and that they can still fly well. Um, and then of course there's lots of tag oh, recovery. And there he goes. And there he goes. So that's all there is to it. Now, that's all there is. Now, the measuring of their wings is something you're doing for your research and also collecting the scales. If citizens or school groups wanted to do this, is there a project where they could get involved in this also? So they can order tags from Monarch Watch okay. um, and they will get sheets of, of 25 tags and you can order different quantities. Um, and then they have a, a data sheet for you to fill out that provides the date, um, the location that you're tagging monarchs at, uh, whether it's a male or a female. And they've got excellent instructions that, that come with it as well. Um, and then. Uh, what, you're, what number you're tagging it with. And then you'll, um, you can either send in the paper copies or you can um, put it in a, a spreadsheet and email it to them as well. And then they'll post the tag returns on their website um, in, uh, in the spring uh, once they get the, the tag return. So they'll uh, contribute money uh, so that locals in Mexico, when they find tagged monarchs, they can report those tags. And so that's, that's how they're able to, to be able to, to report those tag returns. So how many are you planning on tagging this season? Well, last year we tagged 500. Um, and so we... And how many did you find out about? Uh, we found out Mexico? about eight. So eight. that sounds really low, okay. <laughs> but if anything above 1% is really good. So, you know, if you're, if you're just ordering 25 tags, you know, it might be, you know, a couple years before you get, get a return, but it's still, it's great data. Um, it can con contribute a lot to, to monarch conservation. Um, and so, so out of our 500, we had eight, um, eight that were returned, and so we're going to try for um, 1,250 this year. Wow. So, uh, so we'll see how that goes, um, and so, uh, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. We get to use all of our tags. So when we're talking about monarchs migrating, how far do they fly, and how high are they up in the air? Well, they can fly over 10,000 feet. So, you know, if they're migrating through really high, um, you know, they can be, be difficult to see. Um, and on an individual basis in any one given day, you know, most monarchs are going to fly um, you know, 50 to 100 miles maybe. Um, but there is one record of a tagged monarch that made it, I think it was 265 miles. So it'd be like driving from, you know, Stillwater down to, to Dallas. And so, so they can make it quite some distance if the winds are right and, you know, kind of kind of helping them along there. Uh, but then if you think about their whole migration route to Mexico, um, you know, especially if they're up in Southern Canada, um, they can, you know, that's about 3,000 miles. So it's a very long distance, a very long way to go. I um, mean, they have I've had records of, of those from southern Canada uh, making it to, to Mexico. Wow, so. okay. Well, we'll keep our eyes out for those monarchs migrating. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.